All right, uh, there's a few questions that I want to address uh, with respect to the political transition that, uh, that David just spoke about, because I think this is going to be the, the difficult bit, uh, chasing the uh, various rebel groups out of the cities and towns that they occupied turned out to be relatively simple, but uh, where the international community and the Malian state are concerned, uh, the problems that, that remain ahead are going to be the most uh, difficult and vexing ones to address. So uh, in this regard, I want to maybe elaborate on some of the points that uh, David just touched on and also uh, introduce a few new ones. Um, first of all, regarding populations in the north and uh, finding a, an equitable way of absorbing them into the Malian state. Uh, the concern of many Malians, at least in, in Bamako right now, is that uh, the international community in general, and particularly the French government, is getting ready to cut some kind of deal with the Tuareg separatist group, the MNLA, uh, which has already uh, taken great pains to make itself visible after being marginalized uh, from, the, from the scene in northern Mali over several months. Uh, I just read in uh, the papers uh, over the last couple of days that MNLA troops are guiding uh, French and Chadian forces on patrol in the region of Kidal. There's uh, some question as to whether the Malian armed forces will be able or allowed by the MNLA to occupy the city of Kidal and, uh, and the areas around it. Uh, the last I knew, there were no uh, contingents of the Malian armed forces present in Kidal, only the French and the Chadians. This is a question that very much uh, rankles the political class in Bamako and the, the Malian armed forces. They do not want to compromise on the question of territorial integrity, and they feel that they may be uh, asked to do so by some kind of international agreement that legitimizes uh, the MNLA. And the concern here, of course, uh, among the Malians that I'm speaking with is that the MNLA have no legitimacy in, in terms of representing the Tuareg people as they claim, that they're in fact a minority within a minority. Uh, and when we talk about the Tuareg people, we have to remember that uh, they don't constitute a majority of the populations of northern Mali, even the Azawad region that the MNLA claimed as its sovereign territory last year. Uh, the Tuareg are not a, a, a majority in that area. So uh, I think the question of political legitimacy and who has the right to speak for the north, who has the right to speak for the Tuareg, what role will the Tuareg particularly and more generally the different populations of the North have in uh, uh, the Malian state moving forward. These are going to be very thorny questions and I think they need to be uh, uh, dealt with very sensitively if the uh, uh, people, ordinary people and, uh, and the elites in the southern part of the country are going to remain on board with this process. Now the, the second question that I want to address is the army. and. Uh, not only the issue of its sort of effectiveness and cohesiveness on the battlefield, but also its implication in the political process, which clearly goes back uh, for uh, at least a year now. Uh, just over the weekend, I think it was on Friday, we saw reports that uh, the former Airborne Regiment, which had been uh, implicated in a counter coup last April and May. Uh, officially it had been dissolved and, and its uh, troops either deactivated or integrated into other uh, Malian army units. Uh, well, there was uh, uh, some kind of confrontation at the camp of the Airborne Regiment in Bamako uh, involving forces of the regular army, uh, members at least of the families of the, uh, the former Airborne Regiment uh, soldiers. Uh, the fact that this infighting continues to uh, uh, spring up 
within the ranks of the Malian Armed Forces is frankly very troubling and uh, doesn't augur well for the ability of those armed forces to uh, take up the baton from French and other international forces in uh, the months and even years ahead. Um, I think another issue that I'm already starting to see some uh, worrying reports about concerns the climate of impunity and, and uh, uh, lack of the rule of law that was one of the prime motivating factors of the coup and, and one of the reasons that the, the junta that took over last uh, March in Bamako was able to gain some degree of popular legitimacy at home because of this perception of uh, impunity at the top of the Malian state and uh, um, absence of the rule of law. Uh, over the weekend, there was a report in the Malian press that I have yet to see the government uh, address, uh, alleging that two top uh, drug smugglers and, and uh, people affiliated with the uh, Mujao uh, terrorist group were actually released from government custody in Gao by the Malian gendarmerie. Uh, and the, the implication is that they had uh, close ties with uh, people in the, at the top of the Malian state and the, and the intelligence services and the security forces, uh, and that this was the reason why they were released. So whether or not this is actually the case, there's at least a very serious problem of public perception that still today, uh, uh, nearly a year after uh, President Touré's government was toppled, uh, there remains this problem of, of rottenness at the core, that uh, uh, the, the rules aren't being enforced, that people are being allowed to get away literally with murder and with various crimes against the state. Uh, so these are some of the concerns that I have when I'm, when I'm looking at the reports coming out of Bamako, coming out of Gao, uh, and I'd be happy to elaborate on them more in the discussion, but in, in terms of... Uh, uh, the contribution that I wanted to make to this panel, uh, that's, that's where I'd like to leave it for now. Thank you very much, Bruce.